ones. It's a story we've been telling <coughs> at least 150, 200 years, so apparently we like it. <laughs> it doesn't die. It's about Julie and Mishi. <coughs> it's a love story. I guess they tend not to die. Uh, but Julie's a Place, which is a very, <coughs> excuse me, a very 19th century term. But it refers to a girl in the system of Passage, <coughs> which we used to have around here, which was basically a very formal mistress system over at the Orleans Ballroom, which is basically behind this building. They used to have the famous quadrant balls during the 19th century, where only mulatto quadrant and octroon girls were invited, being half black, quarter black, eighth black, anything less they were considered plus a bon, passing for white. They went with their mothers or grandmothers. They were chaperoned. And if a couple wanted to have a relationship, you had to draw up a contract with their mother. <laughs> So I had to buy her a house, she had her own slaves for an allowance. Any children were legally acknowledged by a notary. They had their father's last name. They were carted off to Europe to be educated with all their father's other kids. And when he died, <coughs> the second family got an inheritance from the estate. Not as much as the legit family, but not a little. And all those assets were in her name, so there was no disputing who owned what. So Julie was a part of that population. Julie's the heroine in this story. And Mishi, well, he's her lover, <coughs> sponsor, sugar daddy. <laughs> There's our title for that guy. He's just the guy. But as the story goes, and like I said, it's a famous story in New Orleans. As it goes, he put her up in this house. And this is your classic Creole townhouse. You have your business on the ground floor and you live above it. And their relationship is bliss. Heaven. Perfect. Up until his first wife dies. But when his legitimate wife dies, the inevitable conflict comes up in that she doesn't want to be a mistress. She wants the ring. So she starts in on him begging, pleading, nagging, insisting that he marry her. Well, believe me, he's quite happy to do just about anything else give her anything else. Because a plus A, hey, that's a status symbol. The more you can give your mistress, the more of a man you are. Interracial marriage, not a status symbol. Not in these circles. So she begs, she pleads, she nags. Their relationship's gone downhill through the summer, through the fall, and she shuts up. Quits talking about it, and he thinks, thank God. Now we can get back to our fluffy little relationship, right? It's her respite, she's taking a breather. Because as soon as the holidays start, she's back in on him again, begging, pleading, nagging, insisting that he marry her until on the coldest night of the year, she ultimatums him. She says, you marry me or get out, I never want to see you again. And he says, she, you want me to marry you? I give up. I'll marry you. Uh, on one condition. First, you gotta prove to me that you love me. I mean, really, truly love me. You go up on that roof, in that roof, on that rooftop, enough of what God gave you, and you, hey, if you're there in the morning, I'll believe you. I will. I will take you across the street and I will marry you. Until then, I don't wanna hear another thing about it. Well, after that, there's a knock at the door. Some of his buddies are there. They want to have a party. It's the holidays. Everybody's having a party. So he invites his friends in, and he spends the rest of the night with them. <laughs> Drinking, smoking, gambling, doing all those things Creole aristocrats do in the 19th century. He forgets about her. And before he knows it, the sun's rising. And this is bad, frankly. Because you're not supposed to keep your guest all night long. You keep your guest for a drink. Then you let them go to the neighbors and have a drink there and so on down the street, one drink a house. So he's been pretty rude. He's got to beg for their forgiveness, escorts them outside. Then he goes upstairs to fetch Julie only. She's not there, there's no sign of her. He goes to the next room, no sign of her there. He goes up to the third floor, her bed's not been slept in. Then he remembers that argument the night before and he thinks, well, she would have done a thing like that. 
sad shoes. Everybody wants to be a part of my sad shoes. Anyway. <laughs> she would have done a thing like that. That was just the craziest thing I could think of. I was just trying to shut her up. But he can't find So finally he is compelled to go up on the rooftop and when he does he finds a very cold, very naked, very dead Jewel. Well over the course of the next year, he's so distraught about this that he drinks himself to oblivion. There is no more of him after that year. And people said they used to see him up there on the second floor in the window drinking, smoking, playing solitaire. Probably wondering what he could have done better, I guess. But nobody really reports seeing him after 1853. The mid-19th century rolls around and he fades from the record, but not Julie. Julie's actually one of the most active hauntings in New Orleans. The height of her activity is when they're making a TV documentary about her. Apparently she likes the attention. Uh, this place used to be the bottom of the cup tea room. You could go have your tower cards right 